It is loud music. As it wakes everybody up, John gets them ready for the show. Welcome to Beat Your Addiction Podcast with John Giordano. I'm your co-host, Scott Jones. Thanks for joining us. And uh, we got somebody really, we're going to get right to it today because we got somebody great that we're going to be talking to. John, you've known uh, Dr. Deborah Nash for how long? Over 20 years. Over 20 years. Yeah. Incredible. Done a lot of great work with her. But before we introduce our guest, please remember, uh, share this, like the show, and put your comments in so we know what you think about it. Uh, whenever you're watching, wherever you're watching it, if you subscribe to that channel, that's very important to us. And how we get it out there is by you sharing. So don't forget to do that, please. John, you ready? Yeah, you know, I just like the little intro a little bit. You know, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Mash is a pioneer in Ibogaine medicine. That's okay. plant medicine. And um, she works very diligently and very hard. We got together in 1996. I worked with her in the island of St. Kitts. We had a detox program. This is an incredible, incredible substance. And I'll let her talk about it and where it's at and where it's going. And let's go from there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Keep your minds open. I know sometimes people have reservations about trying new things or even hearing new things. Please, this is how we learn. Listen, and you just might find out something that's important to you. Here we go, Dr. Deborah Mash. Thank you for joining us today, Doc. Thank you for hosting me. Oh, it's our pleasure. And John, I'm just going to let you guys take it away because you guys know the deal here. All right. Then why don't you give a, a little talk about Ibogaine and you know where it's at, where it's going, where it's been, you know, what it does. <laughs> so your listeners probably, many of them probably have never heard about Ibogaine, but Ibogaine is a natural substance that comes from Mother Nature. It is what is called an indole alkaloid from a plant, from the uh, Tabernanthi Iboga plant, which grows in the western parts of Africa, western equatorial Africa and the regions of Gabon and Cameroon. And it was discovered serendipitously that a young, a young man who took a dose of Ibogaine and he himself was addicted to heroin discovered that the medicine actually blocked all of his withdrawal symptoms, but perhaps maybe even more important, it also diminished the desire to go out and use again. So his cravings, his mood was improved, his cravings were diminished, and he simply lost the desire to go out and get high. And for someone who had been using heroin for a long time, uh, that's an impossible outcome. I mean, really, the first time I heard about it, I said, no, that that's not possible. You can't take one dose of, of this plant medicine and all of a sudden you've lost your addiction, that's impossible. What we know today is that Ibogaine, which is now provided for people in a pharmaceutical preparation, a hydrochloride salt, as an actual pharmaceutical prep, uh, is being used by over 10,000 people in places where the drug is unregulated. And patients are seeking Ibogaine treatments in Mexico, in Costa Rica, the Bahamas, parts of Europe and elsewhere to break their cycle of addiction. So these many of these patients are people that have, you know, tried standard of care, have gone into uh, recovery programs, have done hospital detoxes, have done outpatient detoxes. And they simply, even if they can get past the acute withdrawals from mm -hmm. opioids, or the early days of abstinence from cocaine or alcohol use disorder, they are plagued with this horrible depression, what, what neuroscientists will call an anhedonia. They're locked into this, you know, kind of white knuckling state or what some people refer to in the rooms as a dry drunk. You know, people who are detoxed off of, uh, off of alcohol and in early recovery, 30, 60, 90 days. And even though they're not drinking and they're not going through, uh, you know, the acute phases of withdrawal, they simply feel horrible. Ibogaine seems to be very powerful in that it helps to restore brain function. And we're learning a lot about that right now in the context of the psychedelic medicine renaissance. 
So some of your listeners may know about psilocybin or MDMA, which is being developed uh, right now under review by the FDA, actually. And we're going to hear very soon uh, this summer about whether the FDA approves the use of MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder. So these are very exciting times. Ibogaine was used, is used even today, historically as part of religious practices of the Fang Buiti churches, which is an Afro-Christian syncretic church in the region of, that, of Africa that I mentioned at, at the beginning of the, of the show. This is an amazing molecule. Uh, it has not been approved for use in the United States. It is a drug that should only be administered by qualified medical doctors and practitioners, people who have an understanding that it is an experimental drug. But as we talk today, patients who are desperate are seeking treatment. Well, you know, I, I'm glad you brought that up because, see, what happens with regular detox, we call it detox centers, but they're not. They're stabilization units. People are coming out. They're still, you know, they, there's a half-life to these drugs. So as you know, Dr. Mash, when they come out of treatment, out of detox, of stabilization units, then they're asked to go to a treatment center. And most of the time, you know, they just go with the flow or they just leave. And when they get into treatment, for the first couple of weeks, they're really not there. Their bodies are there, but they're not there. What we found out with Ibogaine when we had um, in St. Kitts, they were present and they were they they were open to treatment. And they looked at all their traumas in this dream state that Ibogaine puts you into, which is was really incredible. I, I remember when we used to um, do the treatment, we used to do what he called integration therapy which they call now integrations. I laugh because we were doing that in 1996. Yes, you, you know? were. Yes, you were. But I'm glad it's coming out now. And, and, and thanks to people like yourself that are really going out there, man, and putting their, their stuff on the line. You know, I know, I remember you had a lot of pushback from the university. And I remember what the hell you went through. But you kept your focus and you just kept going. And, you know, and that's the kind of people I like being around that never give up. And, uh, you know, and people don't realize how tiring it is because of all the pushback you get. You know, most people I don't, don't know what a schedule one drug means. It means it's highly addictive and it doesn't have any medical benefits, which is absurd. All right. Believe me, you don't want to spend time in hell doing IBA. Because you're visiting, you're visiting your traumas. You're visiting. It, it doesn't work that way. So, um, so those are the pushbacks, right? Well, there are multiple pushbacks, John. You know, when when you and I met uh, in late 1995, and then I was in front of the FDA, and actually the University of Miami was at that time extremely supportive of what we were doing and you know uh, made made the clinical research center available to us so that we could conduct well controlled approved clinical trial with ibogaine the first of anyone anywhere in the world in fact and our team at the university of miami went in front of the fda the fda was highly collaborative and Really, when I look back on this now, I, you know, at the time, so many years ago, when I was a lot younger person in my career, but we were, we were really at the forefront. We really were because people did not have licenses. The DEA has to give you a license, a Schedule One license to work with these molecules. Even today, same thing. But both the FDA, who once they approved our, our protocol, and then the DEA cooperated and was very supportive also. I mean, my experience with both the DEA and the FDA was nothing but cooperative. They wanted us to have alternative treatments for addiction. They wanted, they, they were very supportive of what we were doing. The issue was that we couldn't get the funding. And the pushback, I believe, came um, much more from the stakeholders 
in our country from people, academics like myself and people in addiction treatment who really, you know, thought, and, and again, you have to put it in a historical context. You have to put it in the context of where we were, John, in 1996. And, you know, recall, you know, we had, we were on the front end loading of the cocaine epidemic in Miami. There was so much, uh, you know, there was so much dope. You know, you looked at the sky, you know, our high rises that went up, you know, on the Brickell Causeway, a lot of that was drug money that was, you know, wandered through South Florida. I mean, we don't talk about it, but you and I both know it's true. I remember when uh, my colleagues at the Miami-Dade Medical Examiner Department did a test of they took money out of 100 random people, judges, lawyers, doctors, academics, street people, took money out of their wallets and tested it for the presence of cocaine. And those tests came back positive. That's so right. a lot of dollars, a lot of hundred dollars. That's what built Miami. People don't know that. If without the drug money, Miami wouldn't have been anything back no. then. No, and there are some, uh, yeah, we won't go further on that. But suffice it to say, we were experiencing it, and I was experiencing it because I was working closely with the Dade County Medical Examiner's Department. There was, uh, the, you know, Miami-Dade uh, ME Department was really the leader uh, in the nation. There were so many uh, top, top, well-qualified medical examiners who trained under Dr. Joseph Davis. Um, you know, it was like every time I went into the ME's office, it was like watching an episode of Quincy on television. Some of your listeners are old enough to know what that show was. Most of, most of the younger ones forget about it, have no clue. But it was all about, you know, life in Miami in the streets and, you know, and these incredible cases that were coming to autopsy. I had been working, you know, studying the human brain and as a neuroscientist and then got pulled into this cocaine epidemic because young people were dying with what we thought were recreational blood levels of cocaine on board. We didn't understand, you know, this phenomenon. And at the same time, we were seeing crack exposed infants uh, that were being delivered at Jackson Memorial Hospital. So our community between the crime, the deaths, the hospital emergency room admissions, the crack exposed infants. Fast forward today, what have we got? We have babies being born to neonatal ICU units that are going through opioid withdrawals. We have xylazines and, and the fentanyl analogs and all of the synthetic more potent opioids being dumped on our society, being dumped on our country I mean, this is incredible for me as a scientist. And I sit here and I look at where we were, John, in Miami at the height of this. And that's when you were, you know, advancing your program and right. literally rescuing people out of crack houses and getting yeah. them into recovery. I remember what you did. I right. know what you did. And it was amazing. And you, you put your heart and soul into that to help make a safe place for people to stay sober. Well, you know, you know what's what the sad part is, people don't understand. You see, there's a lot of good doers out there, and you know, you have the shamans and you have all of those wanting to turn people on to Ibogaine. But the problem is if it's not done um, uh, with medical supervision, okay, it's like you know, people don't realize people die in detox, regular detox. Yes. Okay, they come in yes. so depleted, vitamin depleted, nutrient deficient. Yes. They're on their last leg, and sometimes they die. Now, you know, the pushback on Ibogaine was, oh, people die of a heart attack, people die this, people die that. No, what I believe happens is you have these do-gooders that don't check what's on board because certain drugs, as you know, interferes with Ibogaine. It can cause a problem, okay, where you won't be able to breathe. Um, also, they're not checking the condition of the person, what, what medically, how they are. Are they, are they appropriate for this? They're not checking psychologically because if you're a schizophrenic or, or you have a disassociative disorder, you're not a, a good candidate, I believe, for um, the substance. So we've been around. We did that, well, how many, 13, 14 years in St. Kitts? We didn't have no, we were there from 1996 to 2003. 
Okay. And then we, we carried on uh, with the research, 1996 to 2003, hard to believe, and that we've been out from there for so long. And uh, when we closed the clinic, but we operated another year. And, um, you know, and in many ways, John, when I, when I think back with you and you and I have discussed this many times, I think it was some of the best work I've done in my life. And certainly you were a part of that. I and mean, you led the clinical teams there. You were, you held, uh, you were the strength, the core of the clinical unit. And we had some wonderful people that collaborated with you. And we certainly invited in doctors and external advisors and anyone and everyone who was a stakeholder in the addiction medicine field who wanted to see what we were doing. We opened the doors to them. Well, but I, I, I mean, that integration, I mean, the work, that, you know, I used to say pre-contemplative, pre-contemplative, contemplative, ready for change. And when you and I would welcome people into the unit and they would sign their informed consent, I mean, they barely could read the informed consent. We had to stagger it over several days. You talk about how sick people were when they came into treatment with us. And uh, um, we were responsible for them. We were responsible for them and we were using a drug that did not have the knowledge that we have today. I mean, we really broke, we broke a barrier because we did not know the safety. We did not know the risks. We had an idea. We had a good idea from the work that we did with the FDA and what the FDA advised us to do in the, in the U S approved clinical trial. So we took that, knowledge and guidance, regulatory guidance from the FDA. And, you know, I submitted many reports back to the FDA summarizing the findings that we had and those data that we generated there, all the way from the psychiatric profiling to the, the medical screening protocols, to understanding the pharmacokinetics and how the drug is metabolized, to the post-Ibogaine integration, and then you got patients ready for aftercare. And some of our people went back to their lives and worked in outpatient. Some went to some went to meetings and probably weren't really welcomed in the rooms if they said, hey, I took Ibogaine and then showed up, you know, in, in the meetings. But we encouraged people to go to meetings. You recall that. We said 90 and 90. We told oh, yeah. everyone, you got to well, use I every tool in the toolbox because Ibogaine is not a cure. Ibogaine is not a cure. It is a powerful first step on the road to recovery, but it's just like the high dive of recovery. When you hit the water, you got to swim. Well, you know, I had to retrain my therapist because they said, oh, these people are too well. They think they're too, they're in, uh, you know, and in, in, uh, I forgot what the term is, but no, 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 no. I said, no, no, no. You don't understand. You know, you have to work with them a different way. So I had to retrain them. And, you know, our program was incredible. First of all, I remember they would come to me at G&G. &G. We would put a 24-hour heart monitor on them. we do a toxicology test. We, we did a whole medical workup on them. We did a psychological profile, okay, a psychiatric profile. And then we brought them, if they passed muster, then we would bring them to to you in St. Kitts and you would repeat some of the testing like an EKG and, and, you know, toxicology tests and all the things for a precautionary reasons. Yes. And then what we would do is we would bring them in and we would do a little integration therapy, but, you know, intent is very important with any kind of medicine like psychedelics. If you don't have an intent, then you just go in there to get high and you don't really get high. Believe me, when I began, you go into other places you don't want to be, but it's, for a good reason. So you need an intent and you need to prepare somebody for their journey. Then I remember we used to put them in the bed. We used to put an IV in their arm in case it was an event Then put a heart monitor on them. And then we would have eye shades and we would have a headset with music. All right. And then we had a nurse actually sitting by their bed. So, I mean, where else do you get this kind of, you know, a medical attention and safety protocols? And that's what you did, which was incredible. Okay. And then after they got out, my job was to do the integration therapy. What did you see? What, what went on? You know, to help you how to integrate it back into your life, 
how we could all work together so you could get the benefit from this journey. And then we would take them back to treatment and give them treatment. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, in the treatment center was two weeks, which gave them enough time to, to start to come back into the world and understand what they needed to do in order to stay well. Not get well, stay well. And the outcomes were unbelievable. I remember and the transformation and you saw it. You're my witness. We, many of us saw it. We saw personal transformation so powerful and so stunning that it, it is provided, it provided the strength to me to carry on all these decades. Well, I remember doctors would come there and bring, they said, bring your worst client, bring your worst patient. And they would come and, and the guy is like half on a nod and he's scratching and he's like, you know, slurring his words. And then it's and, and, and 24 hours, it comes out. He's talking like he doesn't even do drugs and he's making sense. And he's like clear and he's uh, ready for recovery. And the doctors would go, what is this? I used to laugh because we've seen hundreds of us people go through began, and that's what we saw. And it was amazing. The transformation was amazing. But when you ever see when people come out of regular detox, they look half dead. Right. They're not there. That, that was the, that's the sad part is that, you know, the, just to, and, and what's happening today is that, you know, the work that we did and the work that I published from our studies over the years fueled the interest. And so these clinics popped up outside the U.S. in the gray zone of medical treatment where they're unregulated, where the drug is unregulated. Right. And unfortunately, patients need to be very vigilant. And it's really a buyer beware kind of situation because you can end up taking Ibogaine in what I call an unsafe setting with people who, you know, some people who have, you know, detox with Ibogaine themselves, then set up these, you know, uh, medical tourism type of programs for people. They may have a doctor, they may not. And that's, that's, the, that's the issue, is that people think they understand how to work with the drug and, and maybe they, they really don't. And uh, that's where you can put someone in harm's way. So we never had that. We were fortunate that there were no drug-related, severe, serious, uh, adverse events. But, you know, we were cognizant that we might see them, and we took extra precautions. We used magnesium. We measured the clinical laboratories. You talked about the medical screening, and you'll recall, if we didn't think that someone was a good candidate for Ibogaine, they were not treated by us. We helped them with a standard of care but we would not give them Ibogaine if they didn't think, if, if we didn't believe, if the medical team didn't deem them to be suitable for the right. treatment. And I, I think these are, this is why it's important to, you know, really bring Ibogaine back into clinical trials, to keep it in front of the, to get the regulatory review, because I believe, and I, I have said this publicly in many forums, that Ibogaine can be administered safely. I do believe that the benefits outweigh the risks. And given the numbers of patients that are going offshore and given the problem of addiction in our society and the trillions of dollars that it's costing us, the effect on the families, the effect on the employers, the effect on the individual and our health care costs, that we in the addiction treatment community need to be outspoken about this to say this needs to be tested. There are funds from the opioid abatement settlements in states all over the United States right now that could be devoted to this. You can imagine we could have collaborations between academic medical centers, hospitals, and treatment providers like your program, John, who understand how to work with this, and we could collect the safety and the efficacy data quickly. And, you know, that's what I hope to do. 
in my company, Demorex, we're also studying the active metabolite of ibogaine or nor ibogaine. And we're going to be developing it also to, to extend that window. One of the things we know about ibogaine is that it opens a window of neuroplasticity in the brain, which is why patients who use it in the setting of detox do better when they go into treatment. What you right. described, the cognition enhancement and the way patients are ready, ready to receive the information and get the cognitive framework going with their treatment protocols, with their counselors, with their peer support teams. It works better. We know this. You know it. I know it. We saw it firsthand. I want to so, add. The nor Ibogaine may also help with this. So we're, our company is working in that direction, too. I was just going to ask you that because we got a few minutes left. I want to make sure we get some questions in that people might be thinking about. And number, uh, one of them, Dr. Mash, is usually when you see something like this come along, it, it's got other purposes as well, or it's being looked in for other things. Um, now, given the, the improvement in neuroplasticity and cognition, are they looking at this? Is anybody looking at this for other uses right now? Yes, yeah, Stanford University um, and Nolan Williams, Dr. Nolan Williams and his team at Stanford published a seminal paper this year. Uh, and I, our, I urge listeners to go and, and find that paper and read it. But basically what they demonstrated was uh, working with special ops veterans that it helped them for their trauma, blast injury, so trauma to the brain. Many of our, our veterans were ex you know, exposed to blast trauma and their cognition, their neuropsych assessment was improved markedly. They also had uh, saw similar things to what we reported in terms of mood and depression, their quality of life improved. And it also helped them to deal with PTSD. So the post-traumatic stress of being have, having multiple deployments on the battlefield, it also allowed our veterans who suffer, when, they, when many of them who suffer and use alcohol or drugs to self-medicate, it helped them significantly. So this is a seminal study, and I think others are, are going to pursue a similar advancement for the drug. So right now, because like other psychedelic medicines, it turns on this neuroplasticity in the brain, uh, these are exciting times for multiple indications of, of drugs in this class. Well, you know, it's like what we do at JC's Recovery Center, which I now am a partner of. It's a faith-based program. I added wellness to it. You know, I always tell people, just because you get off of drugs and alcohol doesn't mean yes. you get off the Titanic. Yes. Okay? <laughs> Most people change seats on the Titanic <laughs> by having eating disorders and all these other different things. And most opiate addicts, they gain tremendous amount of weight. Then they have um, high blood pressure. Then they have pre-diabetic. And then they become diabetic. And all these other medical conditions start popping up because of the way we treated yeah. our bodies doing our usage. Mm. So what what I what I tell people is, listen, if you're not taking care of your body, you're not drinking enough water, you're not uh, you're, you're minimizing uh, the sugars and the processed food, uh, exercise, all these other things, okay, that you need to do in order to live a healthy life, not just living life, not just getting older. Getting older, we can do because they can. They, the medicine today can keep you alive for you know for many more years, but what kind of quality of life do you have? And it's the quality of life that we're looking for, not just living longer. And especially with addicts and alcoholics, they suffer from so many different ailments. I speak to people all the time, and I tell them, look, if you don't straighten this out, all you did was change seats in the Titanic because you're going down. That's great. I'm glad to hear that other people are looking at this too, uh, Dr. Mesh, because as we know, once one use gets kind of accepted, other things start opening up behind it. So we just need that, whether it's the addictions or the trauma or whatever it might be, whatever use comes up first, that's all fine because you could all filter in behind it. But I want to ask you, are we dealing with any kind of prejudice or, or biases when it comes to introducing a product like this? That's a wonderful question. I certainly the the whole area of psychedelic medicine was stigmatized. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you go back and look historically, 
there was some amazing research that had been done for LSD, for example, in the setting of death and dying and also for alcohol use disorder. Uh, you know, LSD is a very safe drug. It, 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 and today, Mind Medicine, a company called Mind Medicine, has a product related to LSD and they have received breakthrough designation from the FDA for their work. So they're fast tracking this molecule for generalized anxiety disorder. As we speak, Compass Pathway has breakthrough designation for fully synthetic psilocybin for treatment resistant depression. And the list is, is expanding every day. So we would like to see the same thing happen for Ibogaine. Well, uh, I, and as you I, say, whether, whether it ends, whether it goes more towards a neurological indication for trauma to the brain or whether it, it, it is more for, you know, addiction medicine. Clearly, we know that it has benefit in both of those areas. And John will be the first to tell you that people who abuse hard drugs have damaged their brains. So having the window of neuroplasticity and help record, to re, restore cognition and function our patients would tell us, Dr. Mash, I feel smarter. What is that? That's a cognition enhancement. Wow. Well, you know, it's the first 30, 60, 90 days is the most important part. That's when people relapse. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So to, to have clarity of thought, clarity of mind and purpose is what I believe Ibogaine does because your cognition's improved. Uh, you, 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 a lot of your traumas are, are on the way to being totally resolved. I remember my son had severe anxiety. He wouldn't even get on a plane. And I finally got him on a plane and we went and we did Ibogaine and anxiety went away. That's it incredible. Went away. I want to make sure that we make this very clear and all of us will agree that we're, we, whatever we're talking about, we're talking about complete supervised treatments. We're not talking about people experimenting with any of this no, stuff on the, their not own. Not in the jungle, not, hanging out with the... Yeah, yeah, yeah we hear that, you know, we you know, uses for LSD, uses for those uses for MDMA. We're not, don't ever, ever start taking any of these things or experimenting with any of these things on no, their own. No, Everything we're talking about requires supervision and clinical work as well. Isn't that true? Yeah. You know what the problem is? Addicts are risk takers. So they'll take a risk. If they hear it might work for them or whatever, they'll just jump in. We don't want you to do that because if it's done properly, like Dr. Mass has done over the years, you will have a wonderful outcome, I promise you. Otherwise, your outcome is not going to be a good outcome. Yeah, you wouldn't do you wouldn't do brain <laughs> surgery with a mirror and a pocket knife. Don't do this either. Get a professional to help you, right, Doctor Mash? That's important. I think that's a great way to put it. And and you know, people need to understand that ibogaine has a more narrow therapeutic to toxic window. So if you take too much of the drug, if you order something on the internet, you don't know what you're taking. You don't know the purity of the drug product. Please don't do that. I'll Please do don't. That. Absolutely. John, we're coming to the end of the show. Right. It's just, how would you like to wrap? I would give you both a chance to just final thoughts to wrap this well, up, John. I, I'm really honored to work with Dr. Mash. I, you know, we're friends besides being colleagues and you know, it's it's someone that that really it's not about the money, okay? It doesn't mean that you can't make money, but it's not about the money. It's about really helping God's kids, and 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 she's on a mission to do that. So am I, and uh, no better pe no better person than I know that's on that mission than her. And Dr. Mash, we could we could talk we could use hours to talk about all of this, and hopefully we'll have you back. We could continue with the conversation. But what would you like? What thought would you like to leave people with? I think it's important to be informed. Mm. I think get the knowledge, read, and speak to your doctors, talk about this in the rooms, talk about it to your treatment providers, get the information out. Uh, people can become citizen scientists. And some of the patients who have taken Ibogaine should log into the OSU Ibogaine registry and share their experience online we need to pick up the pace of the research. And I look forward to being back on the show to give you an update in the not too distant future. Thank you for this opportunity.
Of course. Dr. Matthews, is there some place people can go to get information about you and, and your work and, uh, and Iva Game? Do you have a website? We do. www.damerex.com. And we post information in the public, scientific publications on our website. Fantastic. So please go check that out, everybody. I want to thank Dr. Deborah Mash for joining us. And as always, John, it's good to see you, my friend. And Absolutely. remind everybody out there, if you're watching Beat Your Addiction with John Giordano, you want more information about John and the good work that he does, check out johnjgiordano.com. That's the initial J. The initial J is right there on the screen. johnjgiordano.com, and you can find out about all the work that he's done, past, present, and what he's looking to do in the future. It's all right there. Um, and remind you, please, subscribe to the channel, share it with your friends, and leave a comment because we'd like to hear what you think. For now, you've been watching Beat Your Addiction. Thanks for joining us. We'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.